uh, to the three, three different appeals bodies, and uh, it just indicates that uh, between a quarter and a third of the appeals are overturned in favor of the employee are returned to your uh, respective offices for further development. Uh, with respect to these overturned cases, has there been any analysis regarding uh, a, a pattern of, uh, I don't know, just a failure or a, a gap in the system where uh, these employees are being uh, improperly uh, denied or, uh, I mean, it, it looks like uh, approximately 26 percent of the cases appealed to the Employees' Compensation Appeals Board are settled in the employee's favor. It also seems that the appeals to to ECAB also involve an error found in the initial denial a lot of these cases. Uh, some appeals to the branch of hearings and review and reconsiderations also involve, involve errors found in the initial denial. So we're, we're seeing the appeals, uh, the successful appeals uh, hinging on errors in the initial assessment. Uh, what has the uh, uh, OWCP done to analyze any, any trends in these these cases that may be the the first hearing officer or uh, the first person conducting the analysis is not accurately or or uh, uh, properly assessing the the evidence uh, and uh, do you have any type of training that might help reduce the error uh, thirty you know a third that's 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 a considerable amount of cases to have improperly uh, assessed at the outset that's a huge cost by uh, burdening the appeals process, and I'm just wondering if we're doing any analysis to look back in the, the cases that have been ruled in error uh, to maybe reduce that, that flaw. Uh, a few things I would say about that. First of all, uh, the, the remand uh, overturn rate of uh, both ECAB and our hearings and review uh, uh, internal uh, unit uh, is relatively common within the workers' comp world if you look at state compensation systems. Uh, many of the errors that are, or the uh, overturns or uh, remands at the hearing level especially are generated by uh, new evidence that has been presented or new argument. Uh, so it, it is not necessarily the case that, in fact it's certainly not the case that all of the uh, remands and overturns are error related. Uh, ECAB doesn't take new evidence, but they do take new arguments, so they're, it, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship even there, uh, and obviously in some cases ECAB takes a different, uh, in a particular review of a particular uh, case, may take a different posture with regard to their understanding of the policy and procedure than was uh, taken below, so it isn't, doesn't translate necessarily directly into, yes, the person who made the initial uh, decision was wrong. Nevertheless, to answer your first question, we do review uh, the cases that are returned. We do, we do look for trends. Uh, our, uh, our case, uh, our, our policy shop in the national office uh, evaluates the, deci the, the decisions coming back from ECAB uh, and provides guidance to the district offices about emerging patterns of the kind of the of the nature that you speak to so that is that is a part of what we do and we do the same with respect to uh, hearings cases and the district offices when receiving those cases back the remands and overturns evaluate them individually to determine what is necessary in terms of uh, training or uh, other activities that they need to conduct locally with respect to what's happening in terms of those cases that are coming back so we have, the, I, I think the answer is we are working on those issues. We do have a, a relatively uh, substantial training program that's ongoing. Uh, our uh, our uh, system is now automated, so we have training modules that new employees can go onto the, onto the computer and pull up uh, various modules for the uh, different segments of the work that we do. Uh, that uh, work is still ongoing. It isn't complete yet, but it is uh, uh, it's moving very well. It's progressing, and I believe our training uh, delivery is, in fact, uh, moving towards uh, a much stronger uh, situation than we've had in the past. Uh, and we are also improving our evaluation of our quality in general. We have 
uh, uh, what we call our accountability review system. We review our, on our own motion. This is not from uh, auditors outside our system. We do it ourselves. We review a large sample of cases across all of our district offices addressing all aspects of the work we do to identify what we think is the real quality of the work and then we develop uh, corrective action plans uh, commensurate with what we find in those activities. That system has just recently been substantially uh, altered and I believe improved uh, taking advantage of the fact that we now have imaged cases so we can bring them all, all of the offices work together and do the evaluation for a specific type of case uh, nationwide and then develop corrective action plans nationwide. Uh, and I, I think that's going to have some, uh, some real uh, powerful effects for the program and I look forward to, to improvements along that line. Right. Thank you. Now, Mr. Hallmark, do you, do you look at particular hearing officers and see how they're ruling and whether or not they're in compliance with your own, your own standards or uh, that they might be misinterpreting uh, certain standards? Uh, well, I, I don't personally, uh, which is a good thing because I probably wouldn't be qualified to do that. But uh, uh, the uh, individuals who manage our hearing uh, unit, uh, which as I said is internal to OWCP, uh, are responsible for doing that on a day-to-day -day basis. They evaluate the, the decisions that are made okay. uh, and they provide guidance and coaching. And obviously they evaluate uh, those individuals, their, their uh, uh, subordinate uh, staff uh, throughout the year. So okay. that, that is done. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Seagraves, I wanted to go back uh, to the radiation issue. Now, when you say uh, the machines comply with ANSI, mm -hmm. is that just uh, sort of the model number uh, or do you actually test the individual scanning machines? We, we test the scanning machines um, okay. to ensure that they meet those requirements. So even prior to the deployment, we had the John, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory go ahead and do an independent evaluation for us. So we knew that the systems were designed to meet the ANSI standards. So then, um, as we started to deploy then, each system has to go was through a factory acceptance test. And then once it is deployed to the actual airport, it has to go through a site acceptance test. And then we would proceed with uh, routine preventive maintenance uh, uh, radiation surveys. And we also have an independent uh, team uh, that's been going out to the airports now to perform an additional radiation survey because it's a new technology that has been deployed. And so that's why I was saying whenever we have gone to Boston, to Cincinnati, and to uh, Los Angeles. Okay. So. One of the things that uh, I heard from one of our uh, TSOs is that uh, one of the longer serving ones, he said that uh, prior to 2001, uh, they were allowed to wear these lanyards with dosimeters on their on their person, and then when the when we federalized uh, those uh, officers after September 11th, that uh, they were no longer allowed to wear dosimeters to measure radiation. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what the re rationale behind that was. Well, the rationale was actually the FAA, and uh, they actually in the Federal Register. Uh, prior to 9-11 had removed the requirement for radiation dosimetry. Uh, there was cabin x-ray systems and they had um, data over the years and so they removed the requirement so that whenever TSA federalized then we just we didn't uh, put dosimeters on our personnel then. But it would seem to me to be the case that we're using more radiation machines now than we were in 2000 and so the opportunity for for exposure is, is far greater now. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that because the, the systems that screen are the, the passenger's accessible, accessible property at the checkpoint, as well as that, that uh, screens your check baggage, are called cabin x-ray systems. So they all must meet the Food and Drug Administration standards, so, which is very low. It's something like 0.5 millirankin in, in any one hour. So, and that's two inches from the surface. So it's yeah. not that with, when you installed um, more systems that you now created at a, a higher dose environment, so to speak. Yeah. So. No, I'm just you know mm -hmm. you know, what is the harm? This is not, this is not. This is telling them you, you won't use you won't put that dosimeter on. You will not measure the radiation that you're exposed to, and I'm just uh, that's the rationale I'm trying to get at. Right. In other words, you're telling these workers uh, that they should not take any measures, you know, for their own reassurance in terms of, uh, and it doesn't seem like it would be that intrusive, but yeah. it probably just 
be reassuring to the employee to know that they're not picking up excessive amounts of radiation. This reminds me of the policy that we had uh, during the swine flu. Mm -hmm. When TSA told their workers, you won't wear those, uh, those masks, uh, even the ones on the, you know, the border with Texas, the swine flu emanated from Mexico City, and we had mm -hmm. some of these TS, TSOs, uh, these transit security officers, uh, exposed to a lot of uh, passengers mm -hmm. coming through there, and they were patting them down. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet TSA said you shall not wear those masks because you might scare the passengers. Mm -hmm. The odd thing was that the Mexican TSOs all had the masks mm -hmm. on, which really puzzled me. Uh, you know, this, this, you know, denying them the opportunity to protect themselves and to provide that added reassurance uh, has been denied. And I just, uh, I'm just curious for the rationale there. I know FAA originally wiped right. it out, mm -hmm. but what about continuing it? Well, again, that was, that was before I came on board with TSA, but I, I can tell you, though, since my tenure on TSA, that um, we, again, take radiation surveys, and we also then coordinate with the employees with these independent surveys to make sure that they feel comfortable working around the systems. Our training has beefed up tremendously to address the NIOSH findings from unsafe work, work practices around these systems. And we're also now um, engaged in a six-month personal radiation dosimetry program um, based on the NIOSH recommendation that should be finishing up here shortly. So, and, 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 and what we're finding out right now is that there is, even with that, that, that year-long dosimetry program at the six airports, we are not seeing the levels such that, that would come close to the uh, requirement for the employees to be, to be wearing dosimeters. Okay. Uh, we, we've also heard from some TSA employees whose uh, supervisors allegedly have made it difficult to apply for Federal Employee Compensation Act benefits. Uh, the instances that we've uncovered include uh, refusing to provide the necessary paperwork, uh, actually uh, dissuading or uh, talking employees out of uh, applying for compensation, and also not allowing employees to seek medical attention. Uh, are you aware of, of these uh, allegations or these claims? And while it's a, loadable, it's, a, it's a laudable goal for an agency to seek to reduce on-the-job injuries, it's concerning that, that these efforts appear to result in an agency attempting to reduce uh, case rates by pressuring employees mm -hmm. uh, not to report injuries. I'm a little concerned with that. Well, my office is a little bit different, and I do not uh, manage the Office of Workers' uh, Compensation Programs, but I personally have not heard of any of these uh, concerns and uh, where supervisors have denied employees from filing an, a, a workers' compensation claim. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask you if there are any uh, added points that you'd like to make, any questions I have failed to ask or uh, something you'd like to amplify uh, before we move to the next panel. Mr. Howard? Uh, Dr. Howard? No, sir. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Hallmark? I think we've covered it. Okay. Ms. Seagraves? Uh, the only thing I'd like to, to stress is that the NIOSH uh, study was done in 2003-2004, and um, when a lot of these uh, findings and unsafe work practices occurred, uh, the TSA workforce and agency today is a much different workforce and uh, agency that, that cares for the employees. Their safety is number one, and we have made great strides in ensuring the health and safety of our workforce. Well, thank you. Are you saying the, the study was done, uh, the 2008 report, relied on 2003-2004 data? That is correct. Okay. That's yes. A, that's a very mm -hmm. good point. Yes. All right. Thank you for your willingness to mm -hmm. come before the committee and help us with our work. I mm -hmm. uh, wish you a good day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
Chile. Good afternoon and welcome. Before we uh, afford an opportunity for you to uh, testify, it is, the, it is the practice of this committee to uh, ask all witnesses to be sworn. Could I please ask you to stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that this is excuse me, that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record show that all the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. What I'll do is I'll offer a brief introduction of, of each of our panelists, and then uh, we will go back and allow them each to make a, a five-minute opening statement. Uh, let's see. Mr. John Adler has been the national president of the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association since the November uh, 2008. Mr. Adler began his career in law enforcement in 1991 and has served as a federal criminal investigator since 1994. His experience includes working a wide variety of investigations and enforcing most of the federal criminal statutes. Mr. James Johnson has served as the 16th district vice president for the International Association of Firefighters since 2004 where he represents all firefighters serving in the United States and Canada. Mr. Johnson served as president of the International Association of Firefighters Local F-88 in, in Ohio from 1998 to 2004 and as a lieutenant in the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Fire Department from 1987 to 2004. Ms. Maureen Gilman is the Director of Legislation for the National Treasury Employees Association, excuse me, Employees Union, which represents 150,000 federal employees and retirees. Ms. Gilman focuses extensively on civil service, budget, tax, and appropriation issues. Prior to joining the National Treasury Employees Union in 1992, Ms. Gilman served as Chief of Staff to Congressman, excuse me, Congressman Sam Gadenson. And Ms. Milagro Rodriguez has served as the Labor Relations Specialist for Safety and Health for the American Federation of Government Employees since 1997. During her tenure, she has developed and implemented an aggressive health and safety program featuring education, information, training, and advocacy. Ms. Rodriguez has a Master's of Public Health degree from George Washington University. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Adler, you're now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. It may be too loud now. With all the pain that these noble warriors have endured, the greatest pain they suffer from is unfortunately dealing with negative experiences with the Office of Workers' Compensation and the Division of Employee Compensation. And to illustrate the pattern of how our members have been mistreated, including having to endure financial and emotional duress, I'll discuss five egregious examples. And I'll try and summarize them rather than read them. First one involves September 11, 2001, Special Agent Mike Viani. 
Mike Viani's down there at ground zero, first tower goes down. He's with a firefighter, they hear a distress signal from another firefighter calling for help. Mike and the firefighter run into the tower, burning. They rescue numerous people, including firefighters. They manage to get everyone out safely, and in the process, Mike sustains serious injury. He hurts his neck, his shoulder, his rotator, his back, ultimately results in, in having plates and all sorts of things put in that I don't even want to think about, it's so painful. Subsequent to the incident, Mike files his claim. A little over a month later, Mike gets a phone call from a claims examiner, first time he's heard from OWCP, and the question they put to Mike was, did the firefighter instruct you to go into the building? Now, it's very disconcerting that that was the question directed to him, as if that would gauge whether or not they would cover Mike, a special agent, for running into the building to save Americans. It turns out, subsequent to that, while Mike was seeking immediate treatment, and Congresswoman Norton hit on this earlier in terms of the time lapse between and you sustain the injury and then when payments come, he accrued serious debt. He couldn't have the money to pay for his treatment. His personal supervisor offered to pay his medical expenses on her personal credit card. That's how bad it was. And then some point in 2002, they just lost Mike's file. Um, Mike asked me to deliver this quotation, which is, I would rather run back into the tower while it's on fire than have to deal with the Department of Labor. Second case to refer to also in or around September or after September 11th, 2001, Inspector Bill Palasek goes into the Brentwood uh, Postal Facility because they have uh, information that they have equipment that's anthrax contaminated. They needed to preserve the evidence. Inspector Palasak enters there, attempts to take custody of this evidence, and he is subsequently covered in what seems to be anthrax powder, anthrax dust. Within three, four days, Inspector Palasak unfortunately ex experiences the severe symptoms that one is expected or anticipated to have from anthrax exposure. He files his claim. A lot of time elapses, he goes for emergency medical treatment. He becomes deathly ill, and yet his claim is not, is not accepted. Up until May, I think it's May 2002, no, I'm sorry, December 2002, Inspector Palasak was paying his own bills. And two of the questions put to him between the time of him entering Brentwood facility to, to 2002 was, first of all, is it within your scope to touch a post, uh, filter or a machine when you're an inspector? And then second, they challenged whether or not he was suffering from anthrax exposure in spite of the fact that the filter he removed was, con was proven to be contaminated with it. Now, uh, unfortunately, he ran up serious debt in the process because, again, we just don't have that much liquidity and funds lying around to pay for these situations. And the moment you go for treatment and you fill out the form at the hospital and you say this is work-related, your insurance will not cover it. Moving right along, we have in... Um, November 2006, Special Agent Paul Buda. This made the news in an Annapolis Mall. He's off duty with his family. He witnesses a man being beaten to death by a bunch of thugs. He intervenes, he stops the lethal threat, but in the process, he gets shot in the leg. Now, I have to say, number one, Special Agent Buda is an attorney as well, and number two, he's a triathlon athlete. So he goes for treatment. He has a bullet that is lodged in his leg. He is told by experts that he will need uh, serious physical uh, therapy to prevent or slow down the atrophy that's going to take place just in and above his knee. So he goes for the treatment. Unfortunately, his claim is not approved, and he's accruing substantial debt. And as I sit here, he has personal debt of $11,800 plus because his therapy was stopped in June 2008 because OWCP determined that at this point, if he still needs therapy, he might as well go out on a disability. And this is someone who's an outstanding athlete, an outstanding agent, who wants to come back, and he's someone that I can tell you President Obama wants standing in front of him to protect him. Uh, then we have Special Agent Tim Chard. From 2000 to 2007, Special Agent Chard was involved in busting and dismantling over 100 meth labs on a task force. Unfortunately, as a result of sustained exposure to a variety of toxins that exist at meth labs, late 2008 into 2009, Special Agent Chard starts to experience a variety of symptoms that have been linked to others who have suffered from a severe meth lab exposure. So, Mr. Adler, where did he, where did he serve? Where, what uh, did the, Utah, the Utah um, Drug Task Force. Oh, okay. And, which unfortunately, uh, the ranking member is not here to hear this because Mr. Chard is a constituent of his. But anyhow, um, he is evaluated by Dr. Gerald Ross, who's considered an expert in the area of, of meth lab exposure, who writes a letter saying definitively that based on his review and his examination of Chard, it looks like he's suffering from these symptoms, and he recommends him being enrolled in the Utah Meth Cop Detox Program, which has worked extraordinarily well for 40 other individuals having served in that area and having similar exposure. 
his claims denied. So my organization paid to send him to this, to this, this detox program. He went through 30 days and he came out born again. His high blood pressure stabilized, blood sugar stabilized, his migraines gone, chronic diarrhea gone, and just a host of other symptoms that otherwise we thought he was actually going to go down for the count. So now he continues to be monitored, but he's paying for the expense. And his agency wouldn't, um, unfortunately, allow him to be relocated to, that, to an office near the location as well, which is a whole other issue. But nonetheless, thanks to we had to appeal to law and order actor Vince D'Onofrio to get publicity, to give this guy some emotional support. And it shouldn't have to come down to that. And as we sit here today, his claim is still denied because he can't document every single exposure. Yet the task force commander praised Chard by saying that when the detectives on his task force would otherwise disappear, Chard was front and center every single time. Then we have most recently, this year, we have Deputy Jason Matthew working in Superior Court who was unfortunately stabbed by an inmate who has HIV and was secreting an edge weapon on her person. And in stabbing him, he naturally is rushed to emergency medical care. They were aware the inmate had HIV. They were aware that, that the edge weapon she used, she had secreted on her person, was likely to be contaminated with HIV. So they administered first aid, gave him all the treatment. They, the hospital gave him a prescription for some sort of preventive medication for those exposed to HIV. Well, he takes it, he pays for it out of his own pocket because OWCP wouldn't process his claim. And then he's ultimately told on the phone by an examiner that because you have not been diagnosed with HIV, we cannot reimburse you for this prescription. So we contacted his agency, and his agency immediately paid the bill. Now, what I'm trying to highlight here is a series of events. It's not an isolated issue or five isolated issues. It's a pattern. And what we have here is an inability by OWCP and FEC to process these claims timely, to even understand the nexus between the injury and the law enforcement function, and then ultimately to pay these folks timely. I mean, I have five individuals, all of whom have suffered financial harm, and some of them are still in serious debt, and it makes absolutely no sense. So what I was hoping to do is appeal today for a further review of how OWCP and FEC handles law enforcement injuries and to see whether or not these, inju these, these, these people are being treated properly. I mean, in the end, Heroes should be supported by the Federal Employees Compensation Act. You know, they shouldn't be hung up on a clothesline, let out to dry. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of my membership. Thank you, Mr. Adler. Mr. Johnson, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, appear here before you today on behalf of General President Schaeberger and the nearly 300,000 firefighters and emergency medical personnel who compromise comprise our organization. Over 10,000 federal firefighters serving our nation today face some of the most difficult and hazardous working conditions in the country guarding military installations, strategic sites, and VA hospitals. This unique work places federal firefighters at increased risk for injury and death. Because this is inherent to the occupation and can never be fully eliminated, employers must take every effort, make every effort to promote safe practices. But we must also ensure that when job-related injuries do occur, employees can easily access the care and benefits they deserve. Unfortunately, often the federal government falls short in providing for federal firefighters both pre- and post-injury. Federal firefighters respond to the same types of emergencies as their counterparts in the municip municipal sector, but they also face unique hazards involving incidents at weapons depots, facilities conducting classified work, and aboard naval vessels. More often than in other occupations in the federal sector, federal firefighters are routinely exposed to carcinogens, infectious diseases, and other occupational hazards. To better protect firefighters, the fire service has developed comprehensive industry consensus standards. The adoption and careful application of such standards helps reduce the risk to the employees. While federal agencies have adopted many standards applicable to firefighter health and safety, too often, the same agencies will fail to follow their own requirements at the work site. For example, although the Air Force has adopted NFPA 1582, the standard on comprehensive occupational medical programs for fire departments, it chose to amend the standard in its implementation, eliminating or changing important requirements. Given the serious health hazards associated with firefighting, such changes leave firefighters employed by the Air Force at an unnecessary risk. 
Agencies must not be permitted to water down such standards in everyday use. When injuries do occur, a firefighter should ideally focus on his recovery and returning to work as soon as possible. Unfortunately, too often an injured firefighter must instead battle a slow, bureaucratic, and confusing Office of Workers' Compensation programs. Even before a federal firefighter files a FECA claim, he or she sometimes faces an uphill battle receiving guidance from his or her employer. Often, the injured employee is given incomplete, conflicting, or flat-out wrong advice. Once claims are filed, an employee often encounters numerous hurdles, which significantly lengthen the claim process. The OWCP education process is especially slow. It often takes six months to a year for OWCP to process a claim for employee payments when there are disputes over the claim and 60 or more days for OWCP to process a claim where surgery or other medical intervention is needed. Aside from contrib contributing to an employee pain and suffering, such delays come at significant economic costs by delaying the employee's return to work. OWCP requires duplicate information on various claim forms and OWCP should take steps to eliminate duplicative paperwork as well as expand features within the ACS portal, adding the ability to upload and view medical documentation forms and receipts digitally, eliminating the requirement that such information be mailed. These changes could, would reduce paperwork and the burden on the claimant, as well as reduce costs. Finally, many injured employees have difficulty finding a physician who will accept OWCP claims. OWCP should encourage physicians to accept patients by creating a physician training program and developing resources to help providers better navigate the claims process. Federal firefighters facing an occupationally caused illness face an even greater challenge. Under FECA, federal employees suffering from occupational illnesses must pinpoint the precise incident or exposure that caused the disease. This burden of proof is difficult for firefighters to meet because they respond to a wide variety of emergency calls in different environments under varied conditions. This inability to pinpoint a specific exposure that caused an illness has led to 42 states enacting presumptive disability laws covering municipal firefighters. Based on solid scientific evidence, states have concluded that certain illnesses are clearly associated with firefighting and they presume that these illnesses are job related. Unfortunately, firefighter, federal firefighters know, such, know no such protection. To address this inequity, Representative Capps and Platts have proposed legislation, the Federal Firefighters Fairness Act, to create a rebuttable presumption that federal firefighters who become disabled by heart and lung disease, certain cancers, and certain infectious diseases contracted the illness on the job. By implementing presumptive benefits for firefighters and adopting strong safety standards, at work and streamlining and improving the OWCP claims process, the federal government can help prevent injury and ensure that when an injury or illness does occur at work, the employees may focus on their recovery rather than the status of their claim. I'd like to thank you uh, for the uh, opportunity to appear here today and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Ms. Gilman, you're now welcome to offer uh, testimony for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lynch, for the opportunity to present and to use views on health and safety issues in the federal workplace. Since this hearing is focusing on high-risk occupations, I would like to comment primarily on concerns of transportation security officers at the Transporta Transportation Security Administration. Although many of the problems faced by employees there, particularly with regard to the Federal Employees Compensation Act, exist at agencies throughout the federal government. As we heard from the first panel, shortly after TSA was formed, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health received several requests from TSA employees and from TSA itself to assess the work practices and procedures of screeners and to determine the extent of radiation exposure. The data NIOSH collected led to a series of recommendations, including improved training on radiation issues and proper work practices, improve explosive detection system equipment maintenance, add frequent monitoring of machines for radiation leaks, and conduct additional personal dosimetry on screeners to evaluate radiation doses. 
In 2007, NIOSH also investigated potential exposure to emissions from forklifts and tugs in airport cargo areas. They found that employees were overexposed and issued additional recommendations. Despite these NIOSH recommendations, our TSA members have not seen any personal radiation, detection, uh, radiation testing done. Baggage screening areas in airports are noisy, dirty, and in need of maintenance. At O'Hare Airport in Chicago, for example, our members have recently recorded regular temperatures of over 90 degrees, yet basic requests for fans and bottled water have gone unanswered. With regard to workers' compensation, TSA, to its credit, has reduced FECA claims and injury rates. Unfortunately, NTEU is concerned that some of the decrease in claims may be due to managers and supervisors discouraging employees from filing. TSA changed its management objective reports to include specific targets for injury reduction and associated costs in performance assessments of federal security directors. Our members feel that this has led to the questioning of injury reports and an atmosphere in which lowering the number of claims outweighs the rights of employees to appropriate treatment of injuries and the assurance of a safe work environment. In fact, based on these concerns, we have provided our TSO members with material on their rights under workers' compensation that includes the warning, do not let management intimidate you into not filing. We also look forward to working with the administration on its new government-wide power initiative issued on July 19th to ensure that similar concerns are avoided in that program. NTEU members at TSA have also faced problems in the area of sick leave. On June 13th of this year, LAX Airport in Los Angeles instituted a new leave policy for the entire summer. The policy stated <coughs> that employees would be per, uh, required to provide administratively acceptable evidence for all use of sick leave, both scheduled and unscheduled. This was a change from previous policy, which only required such documentation for requests of more than three days of sick leave. Our members came to us to ask our help in overturning this policy. It seemed to them and to us that it would encourage employees to report for work even when they were sick. In addition, it would require them to seek and pay for medical treatment even if it was unnecessary. I'm happy to report that several members of Congress from the Los Angeles area, including some who serve on this committee, agreed with us, and with their help, we were able to reinstate the previous policy. Ultimately, NTEU believes that the best way for TSOs to achieve a safe and health, healthy work environment is through collective bargaining, and we commend this committee for acting favorably on H.R. 1881, which would grant those rights. We also call again on the administration to issue a directive providing TSOs with full collective bargaining rights. In addition, we recommend that a number of immediate actions be taken, including conducting radiation tests, conducting ergonomic testing in baggage areas, and investigating new technology that would allow machines to do more of the heavy lifting. Local health and safety committees need to be instituted and empowered. Our TSOs have many good ideas for improving health, health and safety in their workplaces. Programs need to be set up whereby TSOs' suggested changes can be reviewed and implemented locally. locally. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to discuss these important issues here today. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Gilman. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, you're now welcome uh, to make an opening statement for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is Milagro Rodriguez, and I am the Occupational Health and Safety Specialist for the American Federation of Government Employees, which represents more than 600,000 federal employees. On behalf of the members of our union, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today on federal workforce safety and health protections and workers' compensation. We hope that the interest of the subcommittee in these issues will result in all federal agencies, but especially the Transportation Security Administration, devoting more time to preventing injuries and illnesses. In general, we believe there is room for improvement in the performance of federal agencies in protecting employees and preventing on-the-job injuries and illnesses. Federal employees continue to face exposure to chemicals, musculoskeletal disorders, work-related stress, and radiation. Ionizing radiation has been an issue of great concern to transportation security officers employed by TSA from the very beginning of the agency. TSOs are worried about the potential long-term health effects of exposure to radiation emissions from the X-ray machines they use to examine the contents of checked baggage. 
as well as carry-on baggage. Over the years, they have asked TSA for dosimeters, a devices used to measure employee radiation, exposure to radiation, but TSA has refused. TSA has held the position that there is no harmful exposure to radiation from the equipment and that it is not required by any applicable standards to issue dosimeters. But the fears remain. Instituting a radiation safety and monitoring program at TSA would address TSO concerns and allow them to focus exclusively on their security duties without being preoccupied with their own health and safety. In 2003 and 2004, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, conducted a study in response to various requests from TSA employees, AFGE, and TSA headquarters. One of its recommendations was that a dosimetry study managed by a health or medical physicist be conducted for at least a year. It also suggested the monitoring be mandatory. NIOSH recommended further study because its findings, that overall employee exposures were low, did not make a definitive case for a monitoring program since wearing a dosimeter for the study was voluntary and may not be representative of all exposures. To our knowledge, the NIOSH recommendation has never been implemented. Given the legitimate health concerns of 40,000 TSOs and TSA's continued dismissive response, AFGE has drafted and is seeking introduction of legislation that would require TSA to initiate the study with NIOSH consultation to provide TSOs who request them with dosimeters and to report to Congress on its findings. In its report, NIOSH made other recommendations which we strongly support. TSA should provide regular radiation training, provide regular training on safe work practices, improve equipment maintenance, periodically check equipment radiation levels and post those results on the surveyed equipment, improve health and safety communication between employees and management. Again, to our knowledge, these recommendations have not been implemented. On the workers' compensation side, we believe that the care and compensation available to injured workers is woefully inadequate. At a time when employees are the most vulnerable, when they need the most help, they often face insurmountable hurdles. The problems injured workers face often begin at the agency where they work. While we see these practices throughout the government, we highlight TSA because nowhere are problems more evident. Agencies decide whether a claim is compensable, although under the Federal Employees' Compensation Act, it is the, worker, the Office of Workers' Compensation Programs that makes that decision. TSA sometimes refuses to accept claims from employees because a supervisor or a human resources manager doesn't think it's a good claim. Agencies persuade physicians to release employees to full duty, sometimes before the doctor feels they are ready. TSA tells physicians their patients are at risk of losing their job, and in fact, some of them do. Agencies impose requirements over and above OWCP requirements. TSA continually demands employees' entire medical file when they request accommodations for their injuries. These and other issues we outline in our written testimony show that required training of agency personnel is crucial. They also show that there is a problem with compliance and enforcement of the requirements of FIGA. We understand that OWCP has no enforcement powers, but there has to be a way to hold the agencies accountable. We urge the subcommittee to request that OWCP identify ways to better ensure the proper administration of FIGA at the employing agencies. The federal government should be a model employer in providing a safe and healthful workplace. We believe this to be a goal we can achieve, and our union stands ready to participate in the effort. Identifying hazards early, abating them promptly, training and educating workers, and providing them with the appropriate protective equipment will help keep the federal workforce from becoming injured or sick on the job. When workers do get injured or sick from their workplace exposures, they deserve to receive prompt medical attention, to have their claims fairly and quickly adjudicated, and to return to work when medically cleared. That concludes my statement. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Let me start. Uh, Mr. Adler, you, you offered some very uh, powerful examples of failings within this system. Uh, all of them uh, really egregious and, uh, and, I, and I think instructive in, in, a, in a way. Uh, how, 
Do you, do you think this is a, uh, a systemic problem or are those, is it, uh, do you have any data, you, you cited in your, in your testimony there are 300 federal law enforcement officers who sustained uh, line of duty injuries each year. Do we have um, data on how many of those were resolved, you know, in, in a, I guess in a satisfactory uh, time frame and, and whether these five cases that you're, you're laying out, you know, are they outliers? Uh, are we doing okay on 80% of the cases and we got to fix 20 or is it, you know, 50-50? Two different sources for the information. The 300, and that was just for the, the, the physical conflict, the other categories of the numbers much higher, comes from the FBI's collection of data. The information I'm providing is anecdotal. We've compiled a spreadsheet of, and we've been soliciting input from our members to provide us with their personal stories. So the five I referenced were five egregious examples that sort of span 9-11 to the present. Right. But we've been cataloging it, and what we've seen is a pattern and in, you know, in answer to the first part of your question, yes, it is systemic. You know, it's a combination. I think it's just it's, it's the cultural impact of sort of functioning on autopilot there. And these are very unique, very, very, um, well, very traumatic, uh, the injuries that we're talking about. But I, so I think, again, it's systemic. It, it's somewhat of the institutional's inability to assess in a timely manner the injury and its connection to the law enforcement duty, because there, it seems to be a pattern of questioning. Was this within your job role to do this? And then second, the pattern which we've seen, and I think you hear it from, from others as well, is the timing of the payments. That there is a protracted period of time where after sustaining the injury, the individual member, the officer or, or whoever's sustaining injury, is paying for their own personal medical treatment. And that we've seen as a pattern, and, and I'd be happy to make that available to you and the committee as well, in terms of the, the uh, anecdotal data we've been, we've been compiling. That's great. You know, I'm a former union president, and, and uh, you know, I've represented injured workers in the past as well. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I know you see this as outrageous, and I think the, average, the, the public would too, in terms of, you know, here is a, a, a bona fide hero uh, on 9-11, going into the, you know, Tower 1, the South Tower, everybody else is running out. And here we have, you know, a bureaucrat saying, well, did, they order, did, did, a, an, did a superior officer order you into the building? Uh, you and I might see that as, as uh, totally absurd and, and beside the point. But I think what's going on behind this, and I think it might be reflected in, in a lot of the testimony here, that these folks are trying to shift costs. That's what they're getting at. They're trying to shift costs. They're, they're saying, well, if, if the Office of Workers' Compensation Programs can somehow disqualify uh, your folks who are legitimately injured um, and push them out of that system, then maybe the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program will pick up the costs of, of uh, paying for, for the health care that that employee uh, requires. And, and that's the game that's being played here. They're trying to shift costs away from that system, reduce their numbers, and force it on to other people. And, uh, and, and in some cases, it's, it's just the taxpayer and it's the injured worker that's, that's losing out because I'm sure when they go to FEHBP, the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan, they're saying, well, how did you get hurt? Well, in the line of duty. And they're saying, well, my goodness, that's a clear case where you should be paid under the Workers' Compensation Act. And so they're, they're being sort of it's like a ping pong ball. They're being de denied on one and denied on the other. And that's why you're having this, they're playing this waiting game uh, and the, the person that's really suffering the worst is the worker and their families, the yeah. person who did the right thing and, and was injured in the line of duty. Mr. Chairman, one, one additional point unique and even unique for law enforcement. We're held under a microscope in terms of candor and giglio henthorn issues, which means our, our honesty, our integrity. We go into a hospital banged up in emergency, and if we're lucky, we can fill out that, that, that admittance form, and we put down it's job-related. 
and now they come back and say it's not. So now they're going to question our, our integrity and our honesty, which could impact our job. Yeah. Just by questioning, not to mention the gap of time. And you know what? If they quickly came back and said within 24 hours, claim rejected, okay. Well, then we get it in writing. We submit it to the insurance company in the hospital and say, well, I must have been mistaken. I mean, it wasn't my job to run into that building. I've, I've been determined it was just my, my, my option, my, my, my fetish. So, you know, at least if they're going to sort of do exactly, and I, and I agree with you, that, that is what's happening in reality, do it immediately. Do it quickly. Just say no, re, you know, denied. This way we know we can still get emergency care and at least have the documentation to show, no, I'm not lying. I'm not a liar. I didn't make this whole thing up. Right. So then I have my agency questioning my integrity and filling out a form. The other part of this that, uh, that troubles me is uh, when you mentioned those, uh, those labs, the meth labs, mm -hmm. and, uh, you, you know, I live in, a, in an inner city, and so we see the consequences where buildings have been uh, torn down because the, the process of these meth labs just eats away at the building itself. And, uh, you know, the, the illustration that you gave of, of the officer who, uh, you know, conducted a hundred or so of these, uh, these meth lab busts, uh, and I, I guess this question could also apply uh, to firefighters in general, Mr. Johnson. We've got this greater level of, of uh, exposure that is, you know, in the case of the TSOs, they're somewhat more standardized. You, you've got the radiation that we talked about and, you know, the, uh, I guess the physical uh, ergonomic uh, uh, hazards that are there in that job. but. The situation that you're dealing with, how, how much training are you seeing in terms of your own officers uh, regarding, you know, being instructed about these different materials and buildings, the different hazards that you're, you're, you're encountering on a daily basis? Uh, some of these are totally uh, unpredictable, I, I would imagine, and, and that, uh, it, you know, every every day is something different for, you, for the people that both of you represent. I mean, you've you got a big population out there in terms of the, the folks that are running into burning buildings and uh, dealing with, uh, you know, hazardous chemicals, just, just as the, uh, you know, law enforcement community is. Are we seeing any training out there uh, to, to sort of update the, the mindset of our law enforcement and our firefighters uh, so that they can better protect themselves? Um, yes, more recently. In the case of, of, of the, uh, the meth cop project, what happens is that, you know, you generate publicity, you get a guy like Vince D'Onofrio who's willing to help publicize the situation, and now all of a sudden there is a buy-in from the respective agencies to allocate, you know, more, more funding towards the training. So I would say now that situation for those working, you know, it's unfortunately lessons, you know, hard learned. In the case of Tim Chard, from, say, 2000 up through 2006, maybe that last year he worked on the task force, they finally got them the, the personal protection equipment that they should have been wearing all along. So I'd say, you know, more recently there is a, a, a greater emphasis on training and equipment, although obviously we're in a bad economical situation where the first thing that gets cut in every agency is training. Yeah. So there's greater awareness, but probably less funding. That's, that's unfortunately <laughs> the reality we have to live with. Mr. Johnson, what about our firefighters? Uh, what are they dealing with in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the training aspect of this so they, they can be better prepared uh, for well, these, these different situations? For the, I think for the, the most part, uh, the training uh, in most cases is, is adequate. Uh, in 2004, OPM uh, included a hazardous material technician uh, classification in, in the firefighter uh, classification standard and a lot of agencies adopted that and and trained uh, if they weren't already trained trained uh, their firefighters as as hazardous materials technicians so from the training perspective I, I think uh, you know obviously uh, more training is always better uh, but I, I think it's it's probably adequate uh, the problem I think that we see at least uh, at some locations is uh, a lot of the situations that the firefighters end up dealing with or going into are unknowns um, because of classified work and, and other types of uh, situations that uh, basically they, they go into a situation where they have no idea uh, what they're getting into. 
what the material is until after the fact. So it's, it's kind of hard to prepare uh, for some circum circumstances like that. And, uh, but you know, the attempt is there as far as, as, as the training, but I, that's my big concern is that there's a lot of unknowns. And uh, in some cases, they don't even know they were exposed and, until you know, far after the exposure took place. So. All right, thank you. We had, uh, we asked the previous panel uh, regarding the radiation issues at the airport. Uh, I'm still getting uh, questions. Uh, I think AFG's representative at Logan Airport, uh, A.J. Castillo, uh, stopped me. I fly in and out of there a couple of times a week. Uh, Treasury employees have also uh, approached me on this issue because you're representing uh, folks in various airports as well. Uh, how do you think we can better uh, bring those assurances to the employees and to their families that we don't have a, you know, we don't have a situation where, uh, because of lack of testing, uh, there's there's some exposure at some level in some of these airports. I would think that the greater assurances we can give to the employee who's standing next to that machine every single day, you know, six or eight hours, the greater protection we can provide for them the protection will be there for the passenger who's just going to walk through, you know, every, every so often, maybe a couple of times a week. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a very positive uh, uh, safety uh, measure in terms of reviewing this equipment on a regular basis. And uh, I just want to know from your, your standpoint uh, whether or not TSA is providing the proper level of uh, oversight of these new systems the testing, is it, is it going on on a regular basis? Uh, uh, is, there, is there some type of pilot program that we could use, say, at the major airports that, are seen, you know, that have heavy use of these uh, scanners, the radiation scanners? And is there a way that we can uh, help you get those decimeters on, on the employee so that they can have that reassurance? Uh, Ms. Gilman? And um, I think there is. I think that um, whether or not the testing is going on, we are unaware of it if it is. And that's a big underlying problem at TSA. There is no communication um, between the employees and the agency. There is uh, a communication th problem throughout the agency, I believe, as well. I was surprised to hear the witness from TSA earlier say that she was unaware of uh, FECA problems. Um, I know NTEU has met with uh, the acting director, Rosides, um, in a meeting where there must have been 10 or 12 senior TSA officials, including DHS Chico, uh, human resources people, um, everybody, and we, we presented them with paper and examples of FICA problems where employees were trying to file claims and were being discouraged. So for the head of OSHA, to say she had never heard of that. First of all, it's not her job, but um, she had also never heard of it. That is, I think, uh, um, an indication of a very uh, systemic problem at TSA. And the communication with the employees is probably the worst example of that. So one of the things that we were suggesting was um, health and safety committees where uh, TSA has to talk to the employees. If they are doing testing, um, the employees are not aware of it. The example that you mentioned earlier, um, comparing the uh, prohibiting employees from wearing the decimeters to prohibiting them from wearing masks during the swine flu outbreak um, is exactly on point. If the employees had information that the testing that they claim is going on and everything is safe, they wouldn't feel that they needed to do this uh, on their own. But that communication is not there, and we have no evidence that the, the testing is there to show that um, the machines are safe. Yeah. Ms. Rodriguez? Um, we also have an issue with the communications problem at TSA. Um, basically, our issue is the lack of communication, telling employees what is going on. We've heard today about some efforts that are, that are ongoing at TSA. And um, as, as um, the other witness mentioned, there is no information to employees about what is happening. So that certainly is, is problem number one. Um, in addition to that, 
um, training and education is sorely lacking. If there are programs um, that they have, they do not make it to the airports. If there are health and safety committees that they set up where um, participation is limited. We don't know when, people, when meetings are. We don't know how to get people on those committees. That kind, that kind of information needs to get out to employees. Um, one of the things that we have been pushing for is, is the actual, the actual the symmetry program. Um, we think that taking that into account would be very important. Paying attention to employees' concerns. This agency has been very dis dismissive. Um, if I raise an issue, I'd like to know that it's being heard. I'd like to know that it's being addressed. If it's being addressed and I have no knowledge of it, then my fears are still there. Right. Uh, risk communication in this field is, is critical. Um, if people don't know what they're being exposed to, if people don't know that it's okay, that you, are, you, might, be having, you might have an exposure, but that it's not at the point where it, where it will harm you, then that is, again, something that people need to know. If I could add one, one more thing sure, to that. Please. There is no transparency, but one example of that in preparing for this testimony, we went on the TSA website and they have some information on health and safety and they referenced the TSA health and safety manual um, and we tried to download it and, and couldn't. So we called TSA and said we'd like to get a copy and they said um, no, it's a security information. It's not available to you or anybody other than TSA employees. Wow. So it's public, it's on their website, but you can't download it? It's not, you can't get to it on the, on the oh, public website. Apparently, employees are allowed on their intranet part of the website to access the manual, but they are not allowed to share it with anybody who is not a TSA employee. It's not available to the union representatives or anybody else. Wow. Okay, we will look into that. Uh, let me ask you, there was, there was another uh, issue that was raised by, uh, you know, I feel like I'm the union rep for the TSA employees because they don't have one. So every time I go through the, the, the uh, you know, the baggage claim there or I go through the screener, they, they sort of, you know, give me an earful about what's wrong. Uh, so I know more about this than I, I want to. But uh, they were telling me that in handling the baggage, uh, the baggage now gets x-rayed uh, on a conveyor and there's a little gantry that comes down and when there's a baggage jam, they actually have to reach in there and, and, uh, and, and dislodge the bags and stop the jam. And uh, that's, a, that's a gap in the system and they get exposure when they, when they do that. When we brought it up with the earlier panel, uh, I believe, I forget which witness addressed that, uh, but I think it was, uh, well, the response was that they're working on equipment. Uh, that might address that issue. Are you aware of any equipment that they're providing that would? Not, not to our knowledge. No. Okay. And the work practices that um, NIOSH referred to um, are still ongoing, and every day employees get told by their supervisors to reach in there and get the baggage out. And okay. so, you know, things um, that tend to slow down the line and pass and keep passengers from getting through um, are problems, and so. People have to do what they have to do, what, what they're told. And we get calls from employees um, raising concerns because they've spoken up and have said, that is not safe, I will not do it. And so they're looking to us to represent them and backing them up and standing up for their health and safety rights. Right. I mean, we had a deal with uh, TSA during the swine flu epidemic, and that was one of the most frustrating uh, bureaucratic messes that I've had to deal with. Uh, you know, they, they would not allow uh, hand cleaner or Purell or anything like that to the to the TSAs uh, TSOs who are actually patting down uh, customer uh, excuse me passengers they're having physical contact with you know 400 500 passengers at a shift and they weren't allowed to have masks and now they're going home to their families after all that exposure it, it just didn't seem you know if we were interested in reducing contamination, it just, uh, it highlighted a lot of flaws, and we kept getting these pronouncements out of uh, uh, the TSA that mm -hmm. did not make sense. Uh, let me ask you, on the, on the equipment part of this, the, uh, how, how, are the, uh, how are the different agencies dealing with, uh, you know, self-contained breathing apparatus or any equipment that might 
uh, help either law enforcement or firefighters dealing with these new and different uh, exposures that we're, we're seeing. Uh, have there been any initiatives out there? Uh, I know we do fire grants and, 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 and police grants on occasion, but uh, they seem pretty sta fairly standard, the ones that I see going out. Uh, but other other uh, technologies and, and uh, is there equipment that's being uh, distributed or deployed that uh, is helping you fight this? I, I think so. I think we've come a long way. The Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, center where the majority of federal law enforcement officers train, uh, have a couple of programs that are geared towards how to use this equipment, how to respond to critical incidents, or be in a situation where it happens unexpectedly. But I, I think the knowledge has certainly increased. I think the equipment is there. It's made more available. Again, unfortunately, the reality we're contending with is in the funding cuts, the availability of the equipment. But I think the specialty units that have greatest risk of exposure to contaminants and toxins do have access now to the protective, the personal protective equipment. And the training, again, based on the availability by, by FLETC. But the trick is each individual agency has to have the money to send their officers, their agents, inspectors, and deputies to FLETC for the training. And that comes with a price tag. So yeah. that's the, really the, the realistic hurdle we're up against. Yeah. Can you use the, uh, the, the police grants to, for training? Is that a, is that a way? No? Yeah. It, it, I, I, know, I know at the state level when they, my, my local uh, departments get that, they can use it for hazmat training and things like that. Yeah, COPS is a great program run out from DOJ, but it, it, we, we, the federal components don't, don't receive the funding benefits from that. I see. It's, it's the same on the fire side. We, we can't uh, benefit from any of the federal grants uh, in the federal fire sector. Uh, so we're, we're at the agency's uh, uh, mercy, I'll say, more or less as far as funding. Uh, the individual agencies uh, have to fund all the equipment, uh, the hazmat equipment, uh, down to the fire engines, the SCBAs, everything comes through through the agency's budget. And unfortunately, what we see is, you know, the, the budgets get cut like every, like every other program. Uh, you put in for a certain amount, you, you don't get that, and, and so you have to make reductions or you don't replace equipment as often as you should. And, and because of that, I mean, on, in the federal sector, we, we do have, you know, some areas, some agencies that don't replace uh, the fire equipment as often as they should. Uh, they're outside of the standards, the industry standards for replacement for fire engines and, and, and other equipment, uh, SCBA. And uh, so we try to stay on them as far as, you know, their replacement uh, of those, those important items. But unfortunately, it's, it's, it's budget driven and uh, uh, we have a tough time in some cases getting some of that stuff replaced. Right. Let me ask, you know, the system that I'm most familiar with is the Massachusetts system. Uh, and when you have a situation where an employee is hurt at, at work and they don't, uh, they, you know, the agency or the employer doesn't uh, acknowledge it or admit it, um, there's still an opportunity for the employee to try to get health care and then, and then later on so, so that the employee isn't just left without health care. And that's the limbo that your folks are in, that they've got to pick up the tab. You've got, you know, other supervisors that are offering to put the uh, cost of medical care on their credit cards. That's ridiculous. Uh, how do we resolve that so the employees don't end up in limbo where, uh, you know, if, if OWCP denies it or just doesn't do anything, it leaves them out there, and yet, uh, in this case, the Federal Employees Health Benefit Plan uh, thinks that the facts would indicate that that person would be covered under workers' compensation. You got a person who's stuck, and that's, you're all describing that, that situation. How, how do we resolve that? Is there, a, is there a quick appeal process, or is there something legislatively that might be done to make sure that, uh, look, that, that person needs to get health care? Is there a way to uh, sort of short circuit the, the, the standoff between, between the two parties so that at least that, that employee gets cared for? Yeah, we, we've made a recommendation to the, federal, the Division of Federal Employee Compensation. In fact, we have a meeting again with the director this Friday. And what we previously recommended to expedite the time 
uh, from when the officer sustains injury is a couple of things. First, they can assign, when, when, it, when it's a law enforcement or a public safety injury that's traumatic, if they assign a nurse immediately to the case, the percentage of success tends to significantly increase, both in terms of satisfaction from our member and in terms of how they administer the process. Because what you have is a person with medical expertise who can quickly assess the situation and make a timely decision or help the administrator make a timely decision. Second, we recommended that they have regional liaisons or agency representatives. So if we have a situation where one of our guys in the hospital and they're getting no response. It could be an extended weekend, but for whatever it is, there's no response from OWCP. And we have that protracted period of time. If we have people, if we have that 911 option to get somebody in play who will have e immediate access to the right person in OW OWCP and FEC, we can accelerate the process. It's something that would, you know, again, fall into certain situations where the injuries are severe and, and, and catastrophic in nature so that we wouldn't have this protracted. So, you know, what we were told, unfortunately, during our first meeting was, well, we haven't gotten any complaints. Um, as far as we know, everything's working out fine. So, you know, with head buried in sand, the world's a beautiful place. So we're now coming back to them with a spreadsheet of all these, 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 these individual cases to try and illustrate to them, hey, there is a real pattern here, and real people who take risks every day are suffering, and you're contenting yourself into this delusion that things are just hunky-dory. Well, that's the most troubling aspect here.